Thank you. So thank you uh, to the organizer, Soikadda, Sourav, and Bimolanduda for uh, giving me the opportunity to present our work here. So I'm going to talk about the uh, optical atomic clock based on yttrium ion that we are building uh, at Ayuka. And that's actually a very recent lab. Just before pandemic, we started the lab. And I will tell you what are the progress that we have made so far to, uh, towards building the uh, atomic clock. So let me begin. So uh, you all of you know that we are going through the second quantum revolution. So quantum mechanics was uh, started about 120 years back. And since then, the life has moved quite a bit. So many quantum phenomena was discovered and they were realized experimentally. And now people are using those quantum phenomena to make actually the devices, like quantum computer or quantum communications and et cetera. So within this last 120 years, there was an enormous development on clock. And that development was because there is a need. So if you look, so this plot is basically saying, this is almost 700 years total. And that vertical axis is saying, the runtime of a clock over which it gives one second in accuracy. So from very early, like let's say 700 years back, we started from here, but let us just focus on last 120 years, that is this block. So about 120 years back, the accuracy was one second inaccuracy was over one year. And today we have reached to an inaccuracy of one second over 300 billion years. And for your information, the age of our universe is only 13.8 billion years. So suppose there was a clock, suppose it's not possible, 400 billion years ago, until today, it will just lose one second. Now the question is, who cares about that clock? Well, until like, let's say five, six years ago, when I was not working in this clock business, I also had this like thing like who cares about this clock but believe me there was actually a lot of things one can do with such a sensitive clocks obviously we don't need to use such a clock to start this meeting yeah but then where is it needed for fundamental science of course there is one other thing like time and frequency metrology keeping standard of time for a country or international standards but even there that sort of accuracy is not really required in today's date. Maybe in the future, it will be there when we have actual quantum communication working between two different places. But right now, that sort of accurate clock is required for doing fundamental science. So that's why you see, I have kept two bars here. One is timekeeping. Always we need better and better clock for accurate timekeeping of a country at par to the international standard. But then there is a shorter bar, which is actually this kind of clocks, which are very highly accurate clocks. They act as a quantum sensor. So they can sense any tiny perturbation, nearly any tiny of let's say electric field, magnetic field, these are all standard, but even it is reaching to a level of accuracy, which can measure cosmic microwave background or a gravitational wave. So that's the need. And that's why physicists, as a physicist, they are always keen to develop better and better clocks. So today I will focus on optical clock. It was already discussed by Origit very nicely. So I won't give you the detail unless it is required. So the parameter which tells you about the quality of a clock is called Allen deviation. And that has two parts, which is delta nu by nu zero. Delta nu is line width of the clock transition. And nu zero is the frequency of the clock transition. So that gives a theoretical quality factor of a clock. And this part is actually gives statistical sensitivity of the clock. Let's not discuss that. So nu zero for a microwave clock is 10 to 10, about 10 gigahertz. Whereas for an optical clock, that is around 10 to the power 15 hertz. So it's a five to six orders of magnitude higher compared to a microwave clock. And smaller the Allen deviation is better the clock. That means if you go to higher frequency, then you can actually meet a better and better clock. That's why optical clock is much better compared to a microwave clock. Well, then the oscillator. So atoms, why this is a very good oscillator? Because atoms have a microwave transition as well as optical transition. So basically you can reach to that sort of frequency like from tens of gigahertz to uh, several hundreds of terahertz in an atom, either by probing an optical transition or by a microwave transition. 
It's a most stable oscillator. If you take a hydrogen atom here or in the moon, they are identical in nature. So only things could be, they are a part of little bit differently, but these atoms can be actually laser cooled and trapped. When I say atom, actually it's atom or ion, yeah. So they can be laser cooled and trapped in a very tiny volume. And over the tiny volume, you can control all the external parameters, let's see electric field or magnetic field extremely precisely. You can say what is exactly the electric field there, exact means nothing can be exact according to the uh, uncertainty principle, but you can measure it with a very, very great accuracy. And you can control over, let's say one micron uh, volume, one micron diameter volume at a very, very high level. So basically what I wanted to say, confinement and laser cooling reduces several systematic uncertainties. For example, if you cool the atom to nearly zero degree Kelvin, then your Doppler shift, first order Doppler shift is basically canceled. Then you are only sensitive to the second order Doppler shift. So basically with the advancement of this laser cooling, trapping, ion trapping technologies, we are able to now reach to that sort of sensitivity so that we can lose one second over 300 billion years. Okay, so there are two types of optical clocks. One is using neutral atoms. So neutral atoms can be stored in an optical lattice. So I'm not going into detail of optical lattice because that was already uh, discussed several times by several other speakers. So you can basically start with MOT and then load, the, evaporate them in an uh, dipole in an optical dipole trap and then load them in an optical lattice. And that's how it looks like there. You can have several thousands of atoms in an optical lattice, which basically looks like an egg carton and then eggs are atoms. And then you probe the clock transition using this clock laser. And this is sort of how it looks like experimentally. This is a strontium atomic clock experiment from Gila. The other type is you can use single ion, not multiple, single ion trap in an electrodynamic trap, let's say Paul trap. Then you laser cool them to millikelvin or sub millikelvin temperature. And there you probe its clock transition. So why can you not use multiple ions here? Because multiple ions will produce an electric uh, Coulomb repulsion due to their Coulomb repulsion that shifts the clock transition frequency. So that will give a perturbation. So for ions, you have to always use a single ion. So each of them has some advantages and disadvantages. For example, here in neutral atom optical lattice clock, you are actually having thousands of atoms. So your signal level is very high. But here you are having single ion. So your signal level, frozen signal level is very, very low. So you have to have a very, very good resolution uh, uh, imaging systems so that you can collect maximum fluorescence and actually distinguish whether you have single ion or multiple ions, high resolution imaging systems. However, ions can be trapped for very, very long time. A typical lifetime of an uh, atoms in optical lattice is let's say second, even if you have a very good lattice. Whereas ions can be trapped for months. So that means your integration time can be very, very large. So you gain there by integrating the fluorescence over a longer period of time. Also for single ion, it's a very clean environment. You, don't, you have only single ion. So you don't have a collisional shift and et cetera, intraatomic collisional shift and et cetera. So each of them have an advantage and disadvantages. And at, so there are several advanced countries who have already developed optical club. They are nicely operating it. And this is a map sort of. So you see then USA, NIST USA, they are pioneer of this clock business. So all the best clock in the world are with them starting from microwave fountain clock to neutral atom based optical clock or uh, aluminum ion based uh, optical clock. Everything is with them, the best clocks. Then Euro in Europe, Germany, Italy, France, um, uh, uh, what else am I missing? So all these places, they actually have very good quality clocks and all of them, they are actually using these clocks for fundamental science. Another place is Japan. So the neutral atom optical lattice clock was actually invented there. The main idea came from there, from Katori's group and they have the best quality optical lattice clocks uh, 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 at their place. China is actually coming very fast. They don't have the best clock yet, but they are close, going very close to having the best clock and they are developing several of them. <clears throat> in particular in India, there are four places. There are initiatives to build optical clock. Let's say NPL Delhi, actually I started my career here and started to build the Tribium ion based optical clock. And I did quite a bit there, developed the entire more or less, let's say quite a bit of the setup. 
and then move to uh, Ayuka. And then I am actually started developing the Tribune ion, ion clock again from scratch here. Very close to Ayuka at ISAR Pune, Umakant is doing strontium lattice clock. And the reason of that he is building strontium lattice clock and I am building yttrium iron clock because of the fundamental science. These two clocks can be compared and actually give very good measurement of alpha violations, fine structure, constant violations, and et cetera. So I, I won't talk about that part today because that's not possible in 35 minutes, but that's the reason why we want to build these two elements clock in Pune. So it can be intercompared very easily between let's say three kilometer distance from each other. And then you have already heard of Origit. He was not speaking about calcium ion clock, but he's also building a calcium ion clock at Tirupati. And all these places are interested to build these optical clocks for different reasons. For example, at NPL, they are the maintaining the standard of the time. So they want to build the best clock in the country because they can maintain the standard of Indian time very accurately. Uh, in Pune, both of us are mostly interested about the fundamental science. And in Tirupati, Origit wants to miniaturize everything. So he wants to build a compact atomic clock, if I'm correct, or Origit. Yeah, so that's the reason that all of us are building this clock. But you know, most of the technologies to build an optical clock, either it is, trans is atom based or ion based, are actually common. So more or less, we have started collaborating each with, other, each with other as much as possible. And this kind of meeting actually helps further. So <clears throat> you can see this is just a very recent result in February 2022. And the accuracy of the clock, optical clock, has reached to 7.6 times 10 to the power minus 21. And if you convert this, it's like one second in accuracy over 300 billion years. And it's so accurate, they can two clocks which are separated by just one millimeter. So one clock is here and other clock is just one millimeter above. The tick rates of the clocks will be different and that they are able to measure. So what uh, uh, just previous speaker, Dr. Mistro was saying this G mapping, there is another thing related to that is geodesy. So that is mapping of the geopotential and that can be done with this kind of quantum sensors, the clocks. So you can map the geopotential of the entire earth with just one millimeter accuracy. And why that is important? That has several strategic importance. If there is a, let's say, uh, something moving, some, some moving, uh, or there is something underground resources that can be also captured if you have that kind of accuracy level of geopotential mapping and et cetera. Okay. So now let's uh, come to this optical atomic clock. Why actually I already introduced you, but let me just do it very quickly again. So one thing is at this moment, the standard of international time is defined with respect to cesium microwave clock, but very soon it will be redefined with respect to optical clock. And how soon it is, we expect that to happen in 2026 in the CGPM meeting. And if it doesn't happen, then maybe the next CGPM meeting which is in every four years. So that means 2030 or something like that. So it's a, there is a need for the country that if they want to stay at par to the global standard, that we have to come up with our own optical clock. Then I already introduced you that optical clock actually works as a quantum sensor and it can sense geodesy, little bit deorientation of the art, which happens every year or actually every day. And then it can probably also sense cosmic microwave background, gravitational waves and et cetera. But there we have to still increase the accuracy of the present clock. With 10 to the power minus 21, probably it's not possible. But people are already trying. There are nuclear clocks and et cetera, which are probably coming up in next few years. Then testing standard model, like uh, whether the fundamental constants like electron to proton mass ratio or fine structure constants, these in our standard model, uh, particle physics model, we consider them to be constant. But probably over cosmic time, like several giga years or so, that's not constant. Since the beginning of the universe, that's probably has changed a little bit. And if it is changing, then our standard model, what we think about needs to be also corrected. That is called extension of the standard model. Or similarly, breaking of the fundamental symmetries like local Lorentz invariance, violations, and so on, that also can be measured by intercomparison of long distance optical clocks. And people are actually already doing those things. So, 
The last thing is actually the applications. <clears throat> like we all know about these applications, they all use clocks, but at this moment, they typically use rubidium clock or cesium clock. But in the future, for example, this communication will be quantum communication. Well, maybe not the general public will use it, but uh, for strategic reasons, but they need a very high accurate clock than what at present they are using. Similarly, for all other things. So there will be a, 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 a the need will be different in, uh, in the coming years, in the probably not in five years, but maybe 10 years or 50 years. So we have to have optical clocks, which have to be miniaturized so that it can be put from different place, even in the GPS, our own uh, Gaganyani or whatever it is. So we have to place them. So these are very several strategic reasons and they will be import controlled. We will not be able to buy these clocks easily from any other country. So India have to develop them here. So keeping all these things in mind, the first thing is, okay, this is sort of the time scale, like this is forthcoming quantum 2.0, we are already uh, going through that thing. And that's always, ever, ever, you know, always we need it. But what I wanted to say you, if you want to develop an optical clock, first is we have to indigenize the technology. And that's what we are doing at Ayuka. So we are trying to do, not to do a compact optical clock to start with, but we are doing it in an entire lab scale, big optical clock, which can be used as a reference optical clock. And then once the technology is indigenized, many of basically then everything needs to be miniaturized. And that is compact systems. And each of them have different applications. For example, the compact systems will be deployable. They can be put from one place to the other places. It can be transported from one place to the other places. If it is a space qualified clock, then it can be sent to the space. And this reference clock can actually participate in fundamental science test or uh, maintaining Indian standard of time, even though we will not be able to do that because that's not our task, but NPL will have to do that. Just give me a second. Okay, so keeping all this in mind, in 2020, we started this precision and quantum measurement lab at Ayuka, and we focused to do quantum metrology, precision measurement and quantum technologies, but heart of the lab is actually optical atomic clock. So everything, what we want to do, these are broader fields, but we want to focus using optical clocks. And these are my list of collaborators, few of them are already present here, for example, Bijay Sahu, and uh, who else? Umakant is not here. Sankarda is supposed to be here. And the funding, what we get uh, from these places. So practically speaking, for fundamental science test, what we want to do, we want to produce a laser, which is nearly monochromatic and very highly stabilized. So even if you take the best lasers in the world, let's say frequency comb, then it's stable enough, but it's not stable enough to do a fundamental science test. They have some sort of uh, like uh, hoppings and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So if I take a best, let's say, uh, not best, but let's say good quality commercial laser and I uh, plot the Allen division of it. So at one second, they are typically 10 to the power minus five or six. And what we want, we want to bring it down to 10 to the power minus 70. So now from here to here, that is an enormous amount of work. And that's what I'm going to explain in my next few slides. So let's say you buy a commercial 15, 15 nanometer laser, which is the communication wavelength. These lasers, as I showed you, that have a typical Allen deviation of 10 to the power minus seven in one second, and they vibrate. If you don't do anything else just by the laser, then the frequency of the lasers are, uh, are changing. And typical numbers, these are some typical numbers, is let's say 100 megahertz per second. So what do you have to do? You have to, you can basically use a reference Fabry Pedro cavity, a Fabry Pedro cavity that I think many of us use. It's just two meters separated by a distance and uh, uh, couple some light to the cavity and then do pond river hall locking and give a feedback to the laser. And then these lasers will actually, if you do this uh, uh, Fabry Pedro cavity very right, that means not the general one that you use in the lab, but take care of all the instabilities and do something with that. It's called ultra stable Fabry Pedro cavity. And if you do all these things correct, then you can bring it down to 10 to the power minus 16 at one second. But then still there will be having some little bit slow drift because aging of the reference Fabry Pedro cavity and et cetera. So that's not an absolute reference. 
But before I uh, go to this absolute reference, let me just explain the work that we have done to produce this ultra stable fabricable cavity uh, in, our, in our lab. So that's not easy. That's not a something like you just put two meters on two sides of a spacer. So it starts with material selection. So this matrix, what you see here, these are the materials for mirrors and spacers. So this is like one mirror what you see, and this is a spacer. So what sort of materials you want to choose for making an ultra stable fabricable cavity? And these first columns looks very good. There are three quantities that we thought that would be the uh, right parameters to choose the right materials. One is effective coefficient of thermal expansion. Second one is delta nu by delta t. Nu is frequency, t is temperature. Delta L by delta T, they are actually correlated. L is length of the cavity. And there we use fused silica mirrors and ULE uh, spacer. And these are the parameters. What you see, this, this, uh, the, the, this is a very good thing, like 0 0.45, that delta L by L that we can get using those two combinations. And fused silica mirrors, because they have a very high quality factor, that means the energy you dissipate on the mirrors can be easily taken, out, taken away compared to any other materials. So we want to produce our uh, 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 this reference cavity using few silica meters and uh, EULE spacer. So now let's see what are the different instabilities that we have to simulate to make the right design. And one part is optical. In the optical, their length of the cavity has to be optimized. You cannot just take an arbitrary length because the modes have to be perfectly separated so that you can pick the right modes uh, uh, correctly. Then that's what I said, frequency uh, separation of the higher order modes. Then radiation pressure and cavity, other cavity instabilities. Then there are thermomechanical part. And the thermomechanical part, there is a deformation due to self-weight of the cavity. Remember, we are talking about instabilities 10 to the power minus 16. And if you understand what it means, let me just give you an example. If you take earth as a spacer, then on two, diametrically on two sides of the earth, if you put a mirror, then we are talking about instability by few hydrogen atoms diameter. So that sort of instability you are talking about by 10 to the power minus 16. And for that, every little detail is actually important. So self-weight, like due to the self-weight, the cavity will be deformed. That is also very important to take care. G fluctuations, we have just heard about the gravimeter. Typically due to high tide and low tide, the G changes by micro, micro G or something like that. And that also changes the cavities. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, like working things, temperature fluctuations, vibrations, and then also the actual Brownian noise that is the limiting factor for any cavity. So that is the material property. You cannot do anything other than cooling down the cavity. Pressure fluctuations. So if you have a, uh, like uh, the refractive index basically changes and that changes the uh, effective optical length. So you have to take care of the pressure fluctuations also. Similarly, all these things. So basically before you can, uh, make your cavity, you have to design all these things and you have to find out the optimum parameters. Oh, I don't have enough time. Okay. So let me go quickly a little bit. So length optimization is basically what you see these fundamental modes and you have to find the plateau where basically all the powers are concentrated into the fundamental mode. And here you see the picture. I have scaled it down to by nine orders of magnitude so that you can basically see the other modes. But basically all the power is uh, in the fundamental mode. Let me go a little bit quicker here. Uh, these are not that much important, but now let me explain you the mechanical stability. We have to find out where exactly you want to mount your cavity. That is called 84 point mount. So you cannot just build your cavity and mount it anywhere. That will give a self weight deformation. And then the small G vibrations will affect it. So you have to find out exactly at which, which point you have to mount this cavity. And as you see here, so these points are called eddy points. So if you are in non-eddy points, so the deformation is something sort of this red curve. And you see here that this is much deformed on the edges, even though in the middle, it's not that much deformed. However, if you find the eddy point correctly, then this deformation is the amplitude of the deformation is much, much smaller even though it, it's like slightly, basically uh, like deformed here a little bit in this direction and deformed in the middle in the opposite direction, but that sort of takes care. 
yeah so you have to find then very carefully what are those points and that's it not a easy thing to find or it takes a lot of time then thermal instability like uh, what sort of temperature uh, can affect the performance of the cavity i mean temperature can be induced by conduction convection and radiation now since the cavity is in ultra high vacuum and there are only very few contact points so conduction plays a very minor role convection it's nearly negligible but most important thing is actually radiation so there are several surface like let's say this metallic surface and then this uh, cavity and etc they acts as a black body radiation so at any temperature that radiates and that heats up little bit it's not that much but very this little temperature change actually changes the performance of the cavity's length for that i mean for that we have to have a multi layer thermal shieldings like you see here three layer thermal shieldings and each layers are separated by a spherical uh, ball so there is a minimum contact point and if you do these things correctly what we found out that if there is an outside 1 degree kelvin temperature change it takes almost 20 days to change 1 degree kelvin inside of the cavity so that what you have to do so now if we can bring it down this 1 milli 1 kelvin to let's say 5 milli kelvin so it will take 20 days to change 5 milli kelvin at the at the cavity and that's good enough to get something sort of 10 to the power minus uh, 16 stability so uh, this is the we have basically uh, uh, estimated all different sorts of instabilities for our particular cavity design so here you can see different uh, sources like vibrations temperature fluctuations and so on so on and this gray ones is the Uh, total instability sum of all these things so i'm skipping this part so here i am plotting that thing again see it's so a total instability of our design cavity and it comes down to below something sort of 10 to the power minus 16 at one second and then it goes below uh, a little bit longer now if i compare our design cavity with respect to the all other internationally state of the art cavities so this is our swan and this is all Uh, from the different other sources these blue ones are cryogenic cavity so these are kept at cryogenic temperatures and these red ones are room temperature cavities ours is also room temperature cavity so you see that we are actually doing quite good so we are here and there are few bit, um, better ones uh, compared to us and that better ones are basically they could control temperature at milli kelvin level and we are little bit uh, like uh, conservative we said that we want to control it we probably will be control it at plus minus 10 milli kelvin range so if we can bring it down further from plus minus 10 milli kelvin to 1 milli kelvin we will actually also reach to that level so second part is okay you have made the cavity you have referenced your laser with respect to the cavity and you make it uh, 10 to the power minus 16 stability but still it's not enough because cavity have some aging so cavity will lose its property over time and that's what i just hand i have just drawn it by my hand so after a certain time this uh, cavity will shift its frequency so you basically you will still have a very slow drift over long period of time like year or years so for that you need an atomic reference and that's what basically this optical clock does so basically what i just said that you have to have the precision measurement of that particular optical frequency which is an highly forbidden transition and then reference this entire system with respect to the laser then you can stop this slow drift so that's the whole setup so quickly the uh, uh, the trap ion optical frequency standard ion will be trapped in an oscillating rf potential so what will happen so you see this is basically this color changes is saying that uh, rf potential their poles are oscillating and the ions when you ionize it it will be trapped inside that when ions are still having lot of energy that needs to be taken away and that you can do by laser cooling techniques and once ions are sub milli kelvin temperature then you can apply the probe laser beam the clock laser beam and that clock laser beam have to be very narrow to excite the clock transition and the clock transition is not an electric dipole transition but it's a highly forbidden transition which is either electric quadrupole transition for our case it's electric octopole transition for neutral atoms it's hyperfine induced transitions so these transitions are very hard to drive so you need lot of laser power 
and these transitions are very very narrow like for example in our case the transition line width is something like few nanohertz technically we cannot reach to that level with laser stabilization etc probably we can go to sub hertz level at this moment and that sort of state of the art at this moment so also the designing of the iron trap it's not a simple iron trap it's a precision iron trap and what do i mean by that see we are talking about a standard a fre precision frequency measurement and there what practically we have to take care is all different kind of systematics and this trap itself induces several systematics and see, okay few of them are like the nature of the confining potential the potential we want ideally 100% uh, quadruple potential but there will be always some admixture of higher order potentials what we have to do we have to make sure that we can get like let's say uh, one part per billion uh, uh, harmonic component of the potential you have to make sure the trajectory of the ion is such that it has a minimum micromotion because micromotion induces this second order doppler shift then other systematic uncertainties like quadruple shift and black body radiation shift so these are very dominating systematic effects in any clock so we have to make sure we have to choose the materials and everything such that your quadruple shift and black body radians radiation shifts are minimum so you have to design the ion trap itself such that all these things have been taken care of while you are designing or machining this trap and that's why it's called precision ion trap so i just give you one example for example the when you apply let's say 1 kilovolt radio frequency at 15 to 20 megahertz then this radio frequency hits off the surfaces of the ion trap and due to this heating up that acts as a black body radiator and that black body radiation gives a shift of the ion which is called black body radiation radiation shift so we have estimated these heating rates or heating things in a, a stable configuration because there will be heating there will be also heat dissipation through conduction and etc so it will finally reach to some stability regime so we have so this is an ion trap and it has several uh, metal part insulating parts and etc but you have to choose the metals and insulators in such a way you get minimum radiation um, heating and actually isita has done this work so there are several combinations like copper chromium zirconium see copper is a good conductor we know but copper is not a good material for this things we have to go to copper chromium zirconium which has very similar properties like copper but it's hard it's machining and also uh, due to this ra fitting things this is a much better uh, material compared to just a copper and for example the uh, insulator makor is a very good vacuum compatible insulator we use for several things in the vacuum but that's not good enough for our purpose we have to go to fuse silica as an insulator and you see the heating if i go take this combination instead of this combination the heating is about factor of 2 different now factor of 2 is not that much but let me tell you this factor of 2 heating difference give you 25% higher in black body radiation or so 25% lower in black body radiation and 25% in 10 to the power minus 21 level of uh, clock accuracy plays the most important role so we have to do all these things before actually we can machine the clock okay so this is the uh, setup vacuum setup this is in fact quite compact but not as compact as so that it can be transportable it will be on a 600 mm by 600 mm uh, small breadboard and the chamber is here so chamber is this one and the iron trap will be uh, mounted here and then uh, the rf uh, the, which comes through an helical resonator will be given through here and this is the pumping part so particularly this iron trap is developed together with the group of sadik rangwala at rri because they also want to do some precision experiment with ions so we have common requirement so we develop it together and most likely orijit will be also using that iron trap for his experiment okay so finally we have now produced this ultra stable laser light the last part is we have to disseminate that ultra stable laser light to a distant location for example let's say from my lab to umakan's lab which is 3 kilometers away or even it could be in a different continent also and that can be done using optical fibers so that's a standard optical fiber communication but no that's not because we have to preserve the phase of the photons and stability of the photons so simple optical communication won't do that 
we have to stabilize the length of the fiber also, even if it is thousands of kilometers. So that itself is another technology, which, okay, I will skip these basic things. So even turns out that if we want to transport that light, which will be, let's say, generated here in our lab to a location where the experiment will be, which is around 10 meter, for this 10 meter also, that fiber needs to be stabilized. We cannot even do without stabilization within the lab also. So uh, what we have to do basically, just quickly, we have, this is let's say lab, and this is another location, which is kilometers away or thousands of kilometers away. Part of the light we have to send back through the same fiber and then compare their phases or phase changes and actively correct that thing. Okay. So we are developing the hardware for that thing, which is based on uh, FPGA uh, and it's in, uh, uh, developed in our lab. So that's what the picture, what you see here. So just a quick view of our lab, because this is a fresh one. So you see Isita is working here, Prohat is working there. And then Sankalpo will be coming up soon. Yes, he is designing the cavity work and This is the actual clean area where the optics table are and he is developing this FPGA based locking electronics. So the all the work that I have presented here today, this is done by uh, uh, Stanley, Sankalpo and Isita and Suja is another postdoc. She just joined recently a couple of weeks back. So I thank them all for their contributions. So in conclusion, basically we are developing the reference optical clock, which is a lab based optical clock and you expect to reach the best level of accuracy. 10 to the power minus 21 will take some time, but let's say 10 to the power minus 18, we want to reach in the first versions. And basically we want to do quantum metrology and quantum uh, enhanced technology using this optical clock. Then Umakant and me are considering to put this fiber between both of our lab and phase stabilization of that fiber link. And then actually we can do fundamental science and using that fiber, if someone is interested, he can also test quantum communication. So quantum bit rates can be much faster using a phase stabilized fiber compared to just a normal fiber. And since IIT, I sorry, ISAR uh, Pune has this quantum hub. So there will be people who working on quantum communication so they can use this, uh, this channel as a test bed. And finally, in the future, this work we have not started yet. Finally, for miniaturization, we have to go to cheap iron trap. You have heard of cheap atom trap, but cheap iron trap doesn't exist in the country as far as I, am, I, I know. So that also we have to develop if we really, really want to miniaturize everything. So that maybe in the future, we'll, we'll start to work. Okay, thank you for your attention. As we are running out of time, maybe we can take one or two quick questions. Uh, so, Subodip, it's actually amazing that you have to look at every tiny detail of the experiment. Uh, it's really, I'm amazed. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have a question. I mean, when you said uh, the state of the art is 10 minus 21, uh, that is with a, a single ion trap? Oh, that is a strontium lattice clock. Okay. And uh, what is the state of the art with uh, single ion? So, that is aluminum ion mm -hmm. at NIST again. Huh? No, aluminum. Aluminium. Aluminium is 10 to the power minus 19. Mm -hmm. Tritium was there, but then it changed to aluminium. So, but then the point is both of these groups, aluminium ion group basically, or let's say any ion group, that they are now putting this entire thing in a cryogenic. So basically there is no theoretical limit why that ion trap has to be 10 to the power minus 19 and why that has to be 10 to the power minus 21. It's only technology improvement and everyone is basically trying to do uh, no, that, that's where I have a doubt. Actually, my question is regarding is Allen deviation, where you write it to be delta nu over nu naught, then there is another factor which is one over square root of n, n times c. Yeah. So if I understand that n is the number of atoms yes. or ions, yes, and c, and is, c, not is, c is not velocity of light. C so, is not velocity of yeah, light. C is number of measurement. Yes. So, okay. it, it, let me, I understand your question. Okay. So, <laughs> you in understand. lattice clocks, your n is larger. Huh. In ion, your n is one. Huh. But in the ion, your C is much larger. C is how many number of measurements you can do. Integration time, let's say. Okay. So in a lattice clock, you are limited by lifetime of the atoms in the lattice. But whereas in ion, this can be very, very orders of magnitude large. So there you can gain. 
I see. So if you allow, I have a suggestion regarding your temperature controller. Yeah. So you know, uh, you want to go to one milli Kelvin. Uh, uh, so uh, in TIFR, uh, you know, this uh, gravitational group where they are doing this uh, torsion balance experiment. They have Only developed. Uh, no, uh, Christian's group. Yes, it's the same group. They have developed a uh, this uh, stabilizer. I mean, temperature stabilization up to one milli Kelvin for. One meter cube volume. Okay. So if you wish, I'll. Yeah, yeah, sure. Or I can and, talk uh, to you. also. Yeah. Or if you can, that would be. Huh, so I'll talk, talk to the scientific officer directly yeah. and uh, you can. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe we can continue this discussion during the tea time or the lunch time. So let's thank the speaker.